sequels are hard. Not only do you have to live up to something that people loved, you also have the pressure of all the new onlookers who expect you to do just that much more. So, if you fumble a sequel, it can be pretty lethal. But if you get it right, people will love you so much more. And in the world that we live in, superhero sequels are just something that we're used to. At this point, they're a commonality. They don't have to be particularly good for people to eat them up. They just have to have something that makes the fanboys clap in the theater so that they come back to clap another day. However, the standard for superhero games seems to be much higher than movies have noticed. Marvel can churn the slot machine and produce 20 projects in the last 3 years alone, and people will just eat it up, but I notice that people tend to be harder on games based on these properties. Maybe it's because of the price compared to movies, or how they're longer and more interactive than just a 2.5 hour long movie that you can forget, I don't know. But what was once a promising reinvention of the genre established by the Arkham games have now turned into corporate money printers that don't quite print enough money. Games like Marvel's Avengers and Gotham Knights have been the laughing stock of the industry and prime examples of where not to take superhero games after Rocksteady's Batman trilogy. The exception to this recent trend of superhero games being bad was Insomniac Spider-Man and its sequel slash expansion, Miles Morales. These games don't feel like corporate slop, but rather the natural evolution of Rocksteady's Batman games. I've spoken at length about how I feel about the first Spider-Man game, and for those who didn't watch it, I really do love the game, despite its many flaws, and it's a prime example of doing a character and the world they inhabit justice, despite the source material it's based on not quite doing the same thing recently. I haven't talked about Miles Morales though, but my thoughts for that game are pretty simple. While being a short game, it's still a pretty good game with a strong cast of characters and better combat and swinging than the original. Marvel Spider-Man 2, not to be confused with Spider-Man 2 the movie or Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro, is the natural next leap in progress for this small series of games. This game is more ambitious than the original, tackling a more original story, with better combat, more options in both combat and stealth, better traversal, a bigger map, and it looks significantly better. While this isn't a perfect game, it's a pretty damn good game, so I want to take a deeper dive into this game and figure out what makes it so good. Some things to mention before I start talking about the game though. First off, this video obviously will be chock full of spoilers. Not only for the game, but I'll also be referring to Craven's Last Hunt throughout the video, so if you haven't played the game or haven't read the comic and want to do so, I strongly suggest you do that and then come back later. Second, I will have chapters and timestamps in the descriptions for those who want to skip around to certain parts. And lastly, I intend to scrub this game clean, as I've already gotten the Platinum Trophy for this game, and it was a pretty short game at that, taking me about 25 hours, but I do have a bit to say about the game. So, let's cover what I think is the most controversial part of the game first, the story. Craven wants a hunt? I'll give him one he'll never forget! <laughs> Trying to talk about this game's story is harder than either of the other two games' story, simply for the fact that this game's scale is massive compared to those two. As I mentioned in my video on the first game, it is apparent that Insomniac really does like Peter Parker and gets him at a fundamental level, as this game opens up with Miles at school on the first day, and the class has a new teacher, Peter Parker. The idea of Peter being a teacher is a very vocalized one within comic book circles, as it would be a natural progression of the character to make him a teacher, but comics and movies are more obsessed with this relatability of him either being poor, in high school, or both. But before Peter can even start his lesson, Sandman decides today is the day that he will make his return, so Peter and Miles have to leave and do the whole Spider-Man thing while the rest of the school evacuates. It's made very clear early on that Sandman has something wrong with him. He isn't acting right, even for a villain, but he won't tell Spider-Man or anyone why other than in cryptic messaging. The purpose of the first game's intro was to introduce the player to an already existing world through its action-packed intro. This game's introduction serves to re-establish where our characters are and set up the new status quo. We have our two Spider-Men in New York at the same time, and they kind of just do their own things, but still come together to save the city when they need to. This intro also helps to show our two characters and how they differentiate from one another. Peter is a more headstrong character, telling Miles what to do from a science perspective in order to defeat Sandman, while Miles is the more physically strong compared to Peter, which is ironic because of his leaner stature. This is reflected within the gameplay, but I'll talk about that later. 
But after the two stop Sandman's reign of terror on Wall Street, the two Spider-Men go around to help some people left in the wreckage and stop some criminals that are trying to take advantage of all this chaos. This takes longer than expected, which means when Peter gets back to school with Miles, he's promptly fired for abandoning his class. Once again, we see the concept of Peter suffering at the cost of Spider-Man in full force here, but instead of it being shown as a mostly negative thing in the last game where he quite literally gets evicted, here is presented under one of the major themes. That theme is balance. Once Peter gets home, he meets up with MJ and they go through some old pictures and memories and whatnot as he cleans up, and Peter goes upstairs to see a hole in the wall he made when he was 16. Within the flashback, the game blatantly spells out this theme of balance, as Aunt May explains to Peter that you can't be good at everything. When I was your age, I was head of the debate club, captain of the soccer team, and second violin in orchestra. But when I tried to add honor roll student on top, I fell apart. Instead of being good at a few things, I wasn't good at anything. So, I scaled back. Because if you have too much on your plate, that plate will crack. The idea of balancing life as Spider-Man and Peter is one that's never really looked at in many games. Most games focus on just being Spider-Man and showing how cool it would be to beat up criminals all day, but I feel like at Spider-Man's core, balance is there, because no matter who wears the mask, they have to balance life as a hero and life as a normal person with family, friends, and other obligations. Speaking of friends, after this flashback, Harry Osborn's waiting outside, finally back in New York after his long trip in Europe, I said that with air quotes because... As this was mentioned in the last game, Peter and MJ thought Harry was in Europe, but the whole time he was actually very ill and being kept in a pod with the symbiote suit. It's actually the first thing that this game shows you, but I feel like it would have been more appropriate to mention it here, since Harry's role in this game is a weird one. It reminds me most of how he was treated in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, as in both cases, they're dying from an unknown disease that killed one of their parents, and they both need their thing to keep them alive and going. For the game, it's the symbiote suit, and in the movie, it's first Spider-Man's blood and then the goblin serum. If you couldn't tell, that movie's bad. And both end with Harry being the antagonist of the story. But what Insomniac does better here than the movie is establish the relationship between Harry and Peter. Granted, the game has more time to do so, but even then, from the start, the charisma between the two actually feels like friends that have not seen each other in what feels like forever. As Harry then takes the player on a nostalgic trip through high school and offers you a job at the startup, which he plans to heal the world. That'll come in again later. Balance comes into play yet again here. While Peter is trying to balance his duty as Spider-Man with his want to work with his best friend, we cut back to Miles, who's also learning to balance being Spider-Man and his personal life. He's struggling to write his college essay and he keeps getting distracted. His lack of balance is causing others to worry about him, since all he seems to care about is just being a better Spider-Man without worrying about the Miles Morales part. Lacking that balance is starting to catch up with him, and if not taken care of, it will consume him. Miles' story is further amplified during a prisoner escort. When he sees Martin Lee, he instantly becomes consumed with rage and doesn't start thinking right. While in this escort, they are attacked by the Hunters. The Hunters are Craven's private militia, and the ship begins to sink. But Miles' lack of balance is visualized here through a scorpion poison sequence similar to that of the first game, where he visualizes others living life without him, and how people tell him that he isn't a hero, he's a coward. And Miles is so off-balance, he even thinks even for a split second, about letting Lee drown. Even with Miles' story set up, it's not really focused on much, since this game is a very Peter-focused story first and foremost, with Miles' plot acting as a B-plot to Peter's A-plot. Miles' entire story in this game is his struggle to maintain the balance of his personal life and wanting to be Spider-Man. It's also about letting go of the past. Everyone in his life has moved on from Martin Lee killing his father. They understand they can't focus on the past or else it'll consume them. Miles, on the other hand, can't do that. He feels like he is responsible for finding and taking out Lee. He thinks that taking out Lee will just solve all his problems, but his problem is that he's not letting go. Because Miles' plot is less eventful than Peter's, I actually think it's handled better than Peter's in some places because Miles undergoes a lot of character development, especially compared to Peter, whose plot is more eventful and makes up majority of playtime. 
the way that the two plots are handled in this game are pretty simple. You have some A plot missions, some B plot missions, and then they converge for a bigger level with both characters. But other than in these big levels, the two Spider-Men don't really interact on screen all too much. They mainly interact via phone calls, which is fine, but it just feels like they kind of wrote aside Miles so that Peter can do his whole Kraven's Last Hunt slash symbiote thing. And I'm pretty sure Miles only interacts with Kraven like twice in the entire game. And that brings me to my next point. Craven and Venom feel like they're barely in the game. This is more applicable to Venom, but Craven is really only seen in cutscenes and phone calls for the first half of the game as we only hear about what he did. We see Craven kill Scorpion, but then it's revealed that he's also killed Vulture, Shocker, and Rhino off camera. It feels like Craven is only spoken of as a threat instead of shown, and I think it would have went a lot further to establish Craven as a threat, like the game says he is, if we at least got to see him kill the other villains as well, especially Vulture and Rhino. Venom, on the other hand, shows up in the third act only, you play as him in a level, and then he disappears until the final boss fight, essentially. It just feels like they should have been there more, since this story is shorter than the first game, but that doesn't devalue the villains by a significant amount, since when they are on screen, they steal the show. Kraven is this unstoppable beast who constantly kicks your ass in and out of gameplay. Similarly with Venom, but instead of being an unstoppable beast who only wants to find his superior in combat, Venom simply wants to create a whole sim symbiote planet in the similar vein to say web of shadows and he tricks harry into thinking that he's healing the world however the fact that these villains don't have extended screen time makes the excellent presence that they have in cutscenes feel meaningless as it feels as though you're never hunting down craven or venom but rather just whacking whatever goon they throw at you before the next boss encounter i think just a little more screen time for both would have went a long way Maybe even add a situation similar in Arkham Knight to where the game jump scares you. In that game, Man Bat would jump scare you as you randomly grappled up a building. In this game, Craven could have tried jumping at you while you swung around or tried to take you out with a well-placed sniper shot that you would have had to dodge. Or Venom could have done something similar, maybe not with a sniper, but just something similar. This wouldn't be a permanent thing, of course. It would just be something that happened once or twice in the story to remind you that Craven or Venom is still out there. But alas... I'm not a writer for Insomniac, so I'm not going to sit here and just think of suggestions for the story I didn't write and how I think it should have gone. Rather, I'll just talk about what was given. And aside from the screen time issue for the villains, the game's narrative, like previously mentioned, is a much more personal feeling story. The bond that Peter and Harry share, even though we didn't see it develop previously, still feels like a deep and personal relationship. The story of these two friends is interrupted by the symbiote and its plans of its own that it has, and the player knows from the start that Harry has the symbiote, so it just causes this sense of tension since it hasn't been revealed to Peter until the Coney Island mission, and this causes a strange series of events to come into play. The next few missions involve Harry using the symbiote to help save Tombstone and learn what the suit can do and whatnot, and this is the second time Harry Osborn has ever bonded to the symbiote, ever. Not like the second time in-game, like the second time in the character's history. It seems like it would be a natural evolution of the character to make Harry Osborn Venom since he has a closer bond to Peter, but Harry's only ever bonded with the symbiote in the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon, so this is uncharted territory for the character, and... I enjoyed this take on the character. Granted, it's not as fleshed out as someone like Eddie Brock, but as it stands, it's still better than when they made Scorpion bond with the symbiote. This is short-lived, however, as a few missions later, Peter dies in a rescue mission for Dr. Connors. Yes, he gets stabbed by Craven and dies for a bit, but as Harry and MJ sit over Peter's body, the symbiote bonds with him, giving the player access to the black suit and healing him. Traditionally, there are two paths that the black suit goes down. The first path is the more comic accurate version, where the black suit simply amplifies the emotions of the host and not inherently making them evil. Then, there's the other take, similar to the Raimi suit, where it corrupts the host, making them more irritable and mean to people around them. Both of these takes are viable when telling a story with the symbiote, and this game takes Route B. But it happens here rather fast. Peter goes from his normal happy self to angry and mean in just the span of a few missions. He stops quipping and starts getting snappy with Miles and MJ who are just trying to help because he thinks that he's doing this all for Harry, but Harry needs the suit that he has to survive. 
Again, the idea of balance comes into play. As Peter loses balance, he becomes so infatuated or corrupted by the suit, he doesn't even know. But this suit, whatever it is, is making him better at being Spider-Man, so he likes it. It's addictive to him. This is further amplified after he beats the lizard and returns him to his normal stature that Dr. Connors explains to Peter that this is an alien suit and it's corrupting him. Peter, or the symbiote, one of the two, denies this and leaves. This is when we get our normal change in dialogue where the symbiote decides to make the host refer to themselves as us and gets easily persuaded to do things that they wouldn't normally do by the symbiote. This change isn't just in the recording booth though, as the game changes the suit to be a visual representation representation of this alien suit becoming just that, an alien. The costume selector even refers to the suits differently, with the first variation of the suit being called the black suit, while the more corrupted suit is called the symbiote suit. This is a little change that wasn't required, but it was something I felt really added to the experience of the game. Miles and MJ notice this too, as Peter starts acting very differently. This culminates in a mission where Peter goes to bed, but Craven's men find him and attempt to kill him. The suit takes over while Peter is sleeping, and MJ gets to see firsthand that the suit is something else, something horrifying. But when Miles tries to save him, he gets surprised and kidnapped by Craven's men. Craven had brought Miles to an arena so that he can fight Martin Lee to the death, and this is where Miles remembers that, at the end of the day, he's still Spider-Man. It's still his job to believe in second chances, even for the man who he hates most. So, he frees him and tells him to go find the other Spider-Man to come save him. So... Lee signals to Peter at feast and explains what happened. Peter then goes to save Miles, but actually falls into Craven's trap. This trap is so Craven can get the fight he is oh so desperately looking for. His last hunt, as it was previously revealed to the player that Craven has cancer and wants to be bested in combat instead of having something out of his control kill him. So this starts a series of boss fights where you defeat and almost kill Kraven, but you're stopped by Miles, and at this point, the symbiote has officially taken Peter over. In this boss fight, Miles tries to tell Peter to give up the suit, but the suit says he won't because it makes him better. But eventually, in the fight, you start getting through to Peter, who says he can't, it's too strong to give up. His need to be the best possible version of himself in order to save everyone is blinding him to the fact that the suit has been doing the opposite and pushing the people he loves away from him. You eventually beat Peter and he rips off the suit and then the suit is contained. At this point, we can see the rage from the alien. What was once a strange organic life form has become aggressive goo in a container, and when it's brought back to Oscorp to be destroyed, Harry is angry. Rightfully so, since his friend took this suit that he needed to live and then comes back with it and says it needs to be destroyed. The symbiote attaches to Harry's rage and then Venom is born. Venom is a ginormous hulking monster that knocked Peter out first swing and goes on a rampage throughout Oscorp where he kills tons of unnamed guards and eventually makes it to Times Square where he is met by none other than Kraven who was hunting Spider-Man but now he finds this thing. This thing is not Spider-Man. It's what he was looking for. His final challenge. His last combatant. So you fight Kraven to the death and eventually kill him. He accepts his death, and Venom bites his head off, killing Kraven. This is a fitting end for this version of Kraven, and I think now is a better time than ever to bring up Kraven's last hunt, as many people, myself included, thought that they would be adapting that story for this game. In the book, it's a very dark story that involves Kraven hunting Spider-Man to show that he's the apex predator, and eventually shooting and burying Spider-Man. He accomplishes this goal and becomes the new Spider-Man, but does it entirely wrong, brutalizing whoever he comes across in a fight, and eventually, brought back by his love for MJ, Peter defeats Vermin in a fight, and Kraven admits that Spider-Man is the better hunter, and Kraven could just never, ever hunt again because Spider-Man has surpassed him. Peter takes him on his word, and Peter leaves, and as we see him leave, we see Kraven take the rifle he shot Spider-Man with and shoot himself, completing his last hunt. This game very loosely adapts that story, as Kraven has cancer, and instead of dying to natural causes, he wants to die in a hunt by a predator greater than him. So he comes to New York to find that combatant, and like I said, it ends with his death at the hands of Venom. So that just leaves Venom as the remaining villain for the game, and his motives are pretty simple. 
He just wants to turn Earth into a giant symbiote home planet by tricking Harry into thinking that he will heal the world by imitating his mother's voice in his head. Yes, it's kind of stupid. But this takes you into the third act of the game, which takes noticeable inspiration from the game Spider-Man Web of Shadows, as New York is engulfed in the symbiote, and it becomes borderline apocalyptic. You rarely see Venom in this part of the game, but rather, you fight armies of people consumed by symbiotes. During this whole thing, MJ calls Peter, saying that Harry came to talk, and when you get there, Harry tries attacking you with the symbiote, since he needs you to save the world. But instead... MJ takes the shot for Peter, turning into Scream. The boss fight that precedes this is one where Peter tries to talk MJ out of the symbiote. Like Miles to him before, they come to understand each other since MJ expresses what she thinks are her true feelings towards Peter in the end of the fight. Eventually, after they get the suit off, they have a stronger bond than ever before. Shortly after, Miles calls Peter because Genki and his mom need help in the subways since it became overrun with symbiotes. On the way to help them, Peter and Miles are overrun by symbiotes and are helped by Martin Lee. Hey, uh, it's me in post, and I was wrong here. Uh, I didn't feel like putting an editor's note on the screen. I'm just going to put in my audio. But that whole Rio and Genki thing, that happened earlier. I just uh, I thought this happened now. But no, they went to Grand Central. Uh, with Martin Lee when he intercepted, and then this all happened. So, just to clarify that before I get any comments, uh, I know I messed up, and yeah, I'm f here. I fixed it. Together, Lee and Miles go inside Peter's head to do something about the remaining symbiote within him. Together, they witness Peter's thoughts and how he thinks he's responsible for everything he could not stop or every person he could not save. Lee and Miles eventually find the heart of the symbiote within Peter, and Lee decides to give him his powers. The transfer of Lee's powers to Peter uncorrupts the symbiote within him and gives birth to the anti-venom suit. The suit actively makes him stronger against symbiotes. It's like his symbiote suit, but without the corruption. Together, Peter and Miles save Rio and Genki, and they meet up with MJ to come up with a plan to stop the symbiotes once and for all. This plan involves destroying the meteor that the symbiote came with, since destroying the meteor would, in theory, destroy the symbiotes and purify the city. If it seems like I'm going too fast through this story, I'm not. This is just a very fast-paced story, and as a result, some characters aren't used to their fullest potential. For example, in the end, Miles shows up with a new Miles Morales original, repeating his arc from the first game and creating his own new suit in order to show that he's more, more than just Peter shadow, but this suit looks awful in my opinion and is just a glorified Adidas ad. And I think they honestly should have used the 10th anniversary suit that's already in the game since it's more unique and looks better. Venom is also not as fleshed out as he should have been, as previously mentioned, and this in turn causes his plan to look cartoonishly evil when the game wants you to think that this is some well thought out plan, despite us not having a full grasp on it since it wasn't fleshed out to us to a degree to where it could be very logical. Anyways, the trio execute this plan, and it first involves Peter distracting Venom while MJ sneaks into the lair and Miles distracts the outside symbiotes. MJ then steals the meteor fragment and takes it back to the Emily May Foundation where they plan to put it in the particle accelerator and destroy the rock. Venom realizes what's going on, grows wings, and flies to the foundation to stop them. And when I tell you my jaw was on the floor this whole ending sequence, I meant it. It's just one utterly insane thing happening over and over and over again. Venom takes Peter out of the fight and it's up to Miles to stop him. After fighting for a bit though, Venom tries to take the rock out of the particle accelerator and he and Miles fight over it. MJ shoots off a tentacle and they destroy the rock, getting rid of the symbiotes, but this leaves Harry with nothing, so he dies. And as Peter sits there, blaming himself yet again, Miles comes over and revives Harry. He's then taken away and put in a comatose state. He's alive, but he's not waking up. This sends Norman into a rage. He vows to get his son back no matter what. He calls somebody to get the G serum ready. And then we cut back to Peter, MJ, Miles, and his family all having a meal to celebrate winning. And Peter tells Miles that he's going to focus on the Emily May Foundation, leaving Miles as New York's only Spider-Man. A passing of the torch. It may not be permanent, but still a status quo change nonetheless. 
This leads into the two post credit scenes, the first of which involves Norman visiting Otto in prison, and he asks for Spider-Man's identity, which Otto won't tell him because he thinks that Norman deserves to suffer. The second post credit scene reveals that Rio has been dating, and early in the story, she tells Miles that she wants to meet the man she's been seeing, but Miles is always too busy being Spider-Man, so he finally meets him, and she's been dating Albert Moon, and he has his daughter with her, Cindy Moon, who is commonly known as Spider-Silk in the comics. These scenes don't really have me soyjacking at my screen like others, but I am genuinely curious about what Insomniac is doing and why it's going to be Superior Spider-Man in the next game. This game's story sets out to accomplish so much more than the original. Instead of just being a good Spider-Man adaptation, it sets out to be a new original story with some light influences from other materials. It sets out and tries to tell the story of balance, of struggles, of heroism, of balancing self-worth, and it all works here. Where the story seems to fail is the rush feeling of the third act and how these villains are used in the story. The game goes by way too fast and each villain only has about 40 minutes of screen time, most of which being boss fights. It doesn't really give these villains enough time to feel fleshed out past what is the bare minimum for these characters to work. But aside from that issue of the villains, I believe that the story for this game is a major improvement compared to the characterization of the first game, especially when it comes to Miles and Peter's main cast. While the story may have floundered in some places, this game has majorly improved within the gameplay. The gameplay of the first game was something special. The fluidity of swinging and traversal in general made exploring the city and getting all the collectibles feel great. Similarly with the combat, it was fluid and felt nice, and despite my issues with namely the gadget wheel and how easy it made combat, I still enjoyed the first game's combat. All these aspects were amplified in Miles Morales. The game had better swinging, more animations, more style to those animations, and the addition of Venom and the limited gadgets made for, debatably, a more fun experience for the player. Spider-Man 2 takes all the good parts of both and amplifies it by 10. Let's go over Traversal first. Traversal in this game is in the same spirit as the other two, but made better by a myriad of changes. First off, the game has much more expressive swinging for both characters, and better trick integration, and the chance to get more momentum when swinging due to two factors, the scale of the map and the addition of web wings. Web wings act as a glide, similar to Arkham, but here it's used to cover long distances where you can't swing, such as bridges to cross islands. With the web wings, you can hit these web tunnels to further amplify your speed, giving you ridiculous amounts of momentum to transfer into swinging that lets you actually just zip from one end of the map to the other. Secondly, the game now has swinging options. These options are options to turn off or on fall damage, and the option to change swing assistance. Fall damage is self-explanatory. If you hit the ground with a certain momentum, you take damage, and you can even die if you say, hit a building while doing a loop-de-loop, -loop, which I did. A lot. Swing assistance, on the other hand, is a setting that determines how the game magnetizes you when swinging. So with the setting on zero, you have zero magnetism. You can hit the ground and are less likely to be assisted by the game when swinging, and the webs actively pull you towards the building. It just makes swinging feel so much better in my opinion. And the traversal system for this game puts the first two to shame. It is by far the best traversal system in any superhero game to this point. From the start, the combat for this game was going to have to be changed in some way. Miles and Peter fight completely differently. Miles is a more physical brawler despite his leaner stature. This was reflected in his game, with his intrinsic abilities replacing his gadgets. Venom and invisibility changed up combat more than the tech-based web gadgets of the first game. Peter, on the other hand, compared to Miles, is a smart man, one of the smartest in the Marvel Universe, so naturally, he would want to have gadgets to make his time fighting crime easier. So, to balance these two characters, you would have to make them play similarly so that one isn't clearly favored over the other. Before Peter gets his symbiote suit, he has robotic spider arms as his abilities, and then they are then replaced by symbiotes when he gets the suit. Side note, but this game is still very much focused on Peter, like I mentioned earlier, so he gets more upgrades and he gets more suits and I just wish they would have focused a little more on Miles since I personally enjoy playing as Miles more but that's just that's just me being a little nitpicky 
But much like the traversal, the combat in this game was majorly overhauled. Instead of having a gadget wheel, you now have four gadgets and four character abilities, either robotic arms, symbiote tentacles, or Miles' Venom based on who you're playing as and what suit you're actively using. These replace the suit abilities from the first game and uses the system from Miles Morales, where you press L1 and a face button. They also changed the way gadgets work since they're not nearly as overpowered here. You have Concussion Blast, which obviously releases a blast that knocks back enemies, Ricochet Webs that web up a few enemies at once, similar to Web Bomb from the first game, you have Web Grabber that brings enemies together, and Upshot, which sends enemies into the air, leaving them open for attack. Binding these to a bumper and a face button keeps up the flow of combat and allows for cooler looking things to happen as you are constantly stopping the game to pick a gadget and this massively improves the combat in my opinion. Combat was also changed when it comes to focus meter. The first game allowed you to heal whenever you wanted because you just needed a little bit of focus to heal. You could perform upwards of 6 finishers back to back to back and it made the game a snooze fest since all those just made you unkillable. In this game, you actually have to sacrifice your focus to heal, as you can only heal when your focus bar is full, which refills much slower than the first game without upgrades, meaning you genuinely do have to decide whether you want to heal or finish an enemy. It's a genuine question you have to ask yourself because they made this game much harder than the original. If you watched my previous video on Spider-Man, you would know I thought the game was piss easy, even on the hardest difficulty. I could leave entire missions with a full health bar, but Spectacular, the second hardest difficulty in this game, was actually hard. Enemies hurt, and I had to perform well in combat in order to stay alive, as one stray sniper shot would take me down to one punch health, and so I would actually have to manage my health and my environment around me. I started a new playthrough on Ultimate, and it's even worse, where Spectacular feels fair but hard, Ultimate just feels like harder hitting enemies that take even more damage compared to Spectacular. The change in combat and difficulty translated quite well with the revamped and actually good boss fights here though. The boss fights in this game are significantly better than the first. In this game, the bosses actually fight you instead of doing the same three attacks, then you dodge, web strike, hit them back a few times, and you just go until you get a certain line of dialogue, meaning you've gotten them to a certain point. The lizard fight, Craven, Peter, and Venom were all great as they made you actually interact with the combat, requiring dodges, parries, blocks, webs, web strikes, and punching. Having a massive window for damage is non-existent in this game. You only have about three, sometimes four hits to get in, and these fights are like three, sometimes four phases long. I know what I'm describing just sounds like the standard for a game like Dark Souls, but the point is, is that they feel like a major step up from the first game and actually feel like boss fights instead of just set pieces that are impossible to lose. Craven in particular kicked my ass a lot. Speaking of major improvements, the stealth here hasn't been majorly changed, but with the addition of the web line and double takedowns, it makes the stealth much more enjoyable than the first game. And instead of just stealthing entire encounters, the game just tells you you might want to stealth, since you more or less just go into straight combat if you don't. And I enjoyed that as the stealth here is still the same in execution, which is not good at its core, but it's slightly more fun. But I enjoyed the option to at least just go straight into combat without having having the whole, oh, you just alerted the whole base thing. But overall, the changes to the gameplay have been a major improvement from the first two games, which is to be expected from a sequel, but the sheer quality of changes here really shows the effort into making one of, if not the best Spider-Man games to ever exist. But the quality of the gameplay also translated really well into the side content. Okay, before we get down to business, there's something I have to tell you. I'm fresh out of honey. Spider-Man 2018 was bloated with side content. There was tons of unmemorable side missions and too many copy-pasted bases across the entire map, with Demon, Fisk, Prisoner, and Sable bases all doing the exact same thing in function. And crimes counted towards 100%, so it left the cleanup for the Platinum Trophy for that game feeling like a tedious slog. Miles Morales was more of an expansion game, so naturally, the game scaled down the amount of side activities, with the player more or less helping out the community instead of going across the entire city clearing off different bases. The only bases in that game were the Roxxon bases that you just had to get rid of, but it made sense because it was relevant to the story, and the game was an expansion title. This game, on the other hand, is the best of both worlds, and each character has their own side quest line and then some shared quests, which are all engaging. 
Like, there's a side quest where one of Craven's robot dogs were found in a blind lady's backyard. So, you find the dog, and it has an arrow in it since one of Craven's guys shot it. So, Genki uploads nice dog videos to it, and you take the dog back to the lady, and now she has a service dog, something she couldn't have before because she was allergic to dogs. Or how about the mission where you have to go find somebody's grandpa, and you track him down to a pond, and he tells you a story about the day he proposed to his wife, and how much he missed is her. Or, the one that got me was the one where you free Howard's pigeons. In that mission, Howard, the man from the first game where you collected his pigeons, asks you to free his pigeons. Once you free these pigeons, you come back and see that Howard died when you were gone. You freed the pigeons, so you freed his soul, so he can finally live with his wife in heaven, since the pigeons were the only remnants of what he had with his wife. The short stories in this game are just that. They're cute little short stories that show how you help the community, because that's what Spider-Man does. He helps out the little guy. My favorite change, though, was the change that they made to collectibles, namely the backpack tokens and landmarks. Since those were used in the first game, they were replaced here by spider drones and photo ops. Spider drones replace the backpacks, and instead of being marked on the map as soon as you get to the region, you actually have to find them all, and some are pretty well hidden. It's a small change, but one I enjoyed infinitely more, because instead of staring at the mini-map to find these, you actually have to look through the city through for the pulsing of the spider bot. It made me want to explore the city more, and the landmarks were also a fun collectible in the first game, but in this game, you have to find photo ops. Photo ops are just people doing different things around New York, like people in the park or mascots of a bodega. These are also not marked on your map until you find them, which encourages exploration, which is an overall good change, and it works well with the revamp swinging and gliding. All the side content in this game is a major step up from the first two games. There isn't too much, but the stuff here is just pure quality. That quality from the side quests is also translated to the open world that these missions take part in. I spoke on the traversal earlier, but the game world here is significantly better. You have the dusk of the early game, the nighttime of the later half, the day in the bright noon sky that you'll spend most of the end game in. These times of day are reflected not only in the skyline, but as the population count is much higher, it really makes New York feel alive. However, you can't change the time of day. That's being added in an update at the end of 2023. That and New Game Plus are just non-existent, and they're designated as just update content. Which is very strange, since Ultimate, the hardest difficulty, is locked until you beat the game once. So why does the game not have New Game Plus, or at least an option to change the time of day from launch? These were features that were also added in an update to the first game, but they especially should have been here at launch, since this game is shorter than the first one. Another change I found disappointing was the suit selection. The first game and Miles Morales have a pretty good suit selection. The first game in specific had some great suits, like the Spider-Verse suit, the Vintage Comic suit, and Bombastic Bagman. My issue is that the suits I just listed, and a lot more, just didn't return here, and were instead replaced by the fact that we need all six Tom Holland suits. Some suits were just excluded for no reason, and as of now, have no plans to come to the game. It's not a major issue, it's just a disappointment for me, since these suits got replaced by suits that I would argue are worse than what they are replacing. But aside from that small gripe with the suits and the New Game Plus, I think the game massively improves over both Miles Morales and Spider-Man 2018 in terms of side content, and if the next game can just take the quality of side content presented here and add some more missions on top of that, I think it'll be great because my favorite superhero game of all time is Arkham Knight, and that game has a lot of side missions, and most of them are really good. They are high-quality content, and I think Spider-Man deserves the same. And also, why do these games not have AR challenges? I'm not going to rant about that, but I feel like they would benefit massively from just having AR challenges to keep that replayability up, or even, like, swinging challenges in the city. But that's just me. <laughs> I normally wouldn't cover controversy surrounding a game on a main channel video because I think it makes the video instantly dated when it releases because the controversy will just die down and the controversy in this game is just comically bad. I said controversy with air quotes because, like I said, it's really bad. I went down a rabbit hole of right-wing reviews of the game where they criticize the fact that it has woke elements. 
These elements include, but are not limited to, doing a side quest as Miles, where you help a guy ask another guy to homecoming, and a side quest where you play as Miles' girlfriend and she finds somebody spray painting walls. But it turns out the spray painter thinks that her art is bad, so she keeps starting over. But you tell her that her art is actually good, and you ask her to join the art club. The caveat is that Haley, Miles' girlfriend who you play as, is deaf. So, you play the level with muted audio, because she's deaf. That's what people are mad about. I think that it just comes down to pure ignorance to Spider-Man as a character, and that's why I'm covering it here. People will sit here and say that we want to play as Spider-Man, not his deaf girlfriend, despite the entire concept of Spider-Man and the best Spider-Man movie being that anyone can wear the mask. It doesn't have to be a physical mask. It can be a metaphorical mask. The idea of the mask is that you go out of your way to help your community, whether it be with superpowers and stopping a big bad guy or just telling somebody that their art isn't dog shit and being friendly to one another. The ignorance of Spider-Man only being the guy with the powers stems from real-life projection of thinking that superheroes are a form of escapism, where the hero gets the girl and saves the day and goes off into the sunset, when in reality, superheroes are a critique of society and shows how a hero can make a difference and how you can be that hero. Superheroes are inherently woke because of the concept of solving social injustice. That's why Spider-Man is dressed head to toe in a costume, because anyone can be anyone under that costume. The content of the hero behind the mask is simply extra dressing. It's simply there to tell a story so you're not just going around helping people, so you have that extra spice, that extra Peter Parker life, or that extra Miles Morales lifestyle. So, making comments like, I don't want to play as BLM Spider-Man, I saw that on Reddit, it makes it even more baffling. This wasn't a long part of the video, and it was more of just a side tangent, that's why it's called Chapter 3.5, but... I think it was important enough to mention, I just smacked my wire, because this happens every time Insomniac includes something that people even remotely resemble as political. I don't even want to get into the MJ and Black Cat stuff on Twitter because they're just, they're just weirdos. So now let's move on to the conclusion. Marvel's Spider-Man 2 is an exceptional game. It's not game of the year, though, because competition this year is stiff, and the game does have its problems. Problems like the villain's motives not always making the best sense, or the lack of content like New Game Plus that should have been there since start. It's a relatively short game, and the suit selection is worse than before in some aspects. But... Despite those problems, you still have some excellent features, like the changes to the still fun combat, the complete speed and gameplay overhaul of traversal, and the ambitious and unique story, and the amazing world map. And the side content for this game is better than both PS4 counterparts and is a contender for greatest superhero game of all time. And it truly just does make me excited for Insomniac's Wolverine and any future Spider-Man games that the studio is cooking, since they clearly know what they're doing. But, yeah, that's all I really have to say about Spider-Man 2. Um, I would just like to thank you guys for making it to the end of the video if you did make it this far. Or if you just skipped to the end, I mean, either way, thanks for watching, I guess. Um, yeah, this one took me a minute to make. Like, uh, I'm staring at this document right now, and it's a lot longer than I intended it to be. I know this video is probably going to be similar in length to my last one, but that's because... This one's more of just, just me talking. Like, my voice is kind of fried now because I've been talking for 40 minutes straight. Uh, about closer to an hour, if you include all the mistakes. That, uh, I went through a lot of those. <laughs> um, but yeah, my voice is just fried right now. And yeah, if, yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything else to say. Uh, thank you guys for watching and see you later.